Hello and welcome to the third lecture of week four of the Open University's MOOC on Genocide. We continue our discussion on the murder of the gypsies by Nazi Germany during World War II. Today's lecture will focus on an issue I find particularly interesting, the creation of the so-called Aryan myth. In this lecture, we'll understand how terms like Aryan or Semite came to be. We'll examine the implications on the fate of the gypsies and how they were perceived towards the end of the 19th century by various German researchers and racial theorists who were active before and during the Nazi period. In order to fully understand this, we must go back in time to the late 18th century to a territory that had nothing to do with Germany. We venture out for a few minutes to India, under British rule in the late 18th century, 1784 to be precise, to the city of Calcutta, the capital of British India. We find a judge named Sir William Jones, who is sent there to serve as the president of Calcutta's Supreme Court. Besides being a jurist, William Jones is a real Renaissance man. One thing he excels in is his extraordinary linguistic skills. Philology wasn't really recognized or practiced as an academic discipline in the end of the 18th century, but existed in practice even before the 19th century. Jones is a great example of a modern linguist who spoke tens of languages. Even before he arrives in India, he already fluently speaks a dozen Oriental languages, including Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, and a few others. When Jones arrives in India, one of his main goals is to study the holy and ancient Hindu language called Sanskrit. This is the language of early Hindu scripture, as well as law books, some astronomy writings, and many other pieces. The priestly Brahmin caste in India refuses to teach this language to non-Hindu foreigners because they consider it a holy language given by the gods, and non-Hindu foreigners learning it, that would cons constitute desecration. Jones, the British judge in Calcutta who arrives there in 1784, convinces a Brahmin doctor to teach him Sanskrit, the holy Hindu language, in secret. Within two years, he learns this complex and layered language. He is amazed to find out dur during his studies the great similarities in his linguistic opinion between Sanskrit, the ancient Hindu language, and the two core languages of European culture, Greek and Latin. There are many examples of this proximity. I won't start listing them right now, but many words in Sanskrit are identical to their Greek and Latin equivalents, be it father, mother, and many more. The Sanskrit alphabet is also similar to the Latin, and in terms of grammatical structure, it is very similar to the core European languages. Jones tries to find an explanation for this, considering the fact that for thousands of years there were no commercial, military or diplomatic ties between India and Europe. Usually, when we notice a great similarity between two or more languages, we can determine that they have a common origin. If you wonder what the sister languages of Hebrew, for example, are, the answer is obvious. Firstly, Arabic, which is totally obvious, and then there is Aramaic, which is clearly a sister language of Hebrew. It was the common spoken language in this region, in the Middle East, during the period of the Second Temple. And of course, several other languages originating in our area, the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, and the Arab Peninsula. So this example clearly illustrates a common geographical and cultural source that spawned sister languages with a common origin. They are called sister languages by modern linguistics. The same goes for European languages like German, English, Dutch and others, which are clearly very similar, just as French, Romanian, Spanish, Italian and Portuguese originate from Latin, it's clear that all these are sister languages with a common mother. Most spoken languages in Europe indeed originate from Greek or Latin, and most spoken languages in India today originate from Sanskrit, the early holy Hindu language. Bengali, Hindi, Gujarati, Punjabi, and tens of other languages all have a common ancestor. 
William Jones, the British linguist active in India during the late 18th century, tried to explain the close similarity between Sanskrit and Greek and Latin, even though they don't share any apparent geographical or cultural source, unlike the example I just gave of the familiar Semitic languages from the Middle East. To find an explanation to this, he comes up with a theory, a historic hypothesis that we, we researchers now call the Aryan myth in retrospect. Why is it a myth? Because other than the linguistic aspect, this theory has no scientific proof whatsoever. Why is there an Aryan myth? As you are about to see, this will become clear in a minute or two. William Jones claims that sometime in prehistory, an ancient nation lived in the area of Iran, pretty much halfway between India and Europe, geographically speaking. They were called the Arya nation. He took the word Arya from the holy Hindu language Sanskrit, which means noble, and attributed it to an imaginary nation he claimed existed long ago in the area of Iran. According to Jones, at a certain point in the history of that ancient Aryan nation, some of its people decided to migrate west, and they took over Europe, the Western Aryans. Meanwhile, while other ancient Aryans decided to migrate east from Iran to take over India, becoming Eastern Aryans as they go, if you will. In the initial phase of this migration, both the Eastern Aryans in India and the Western Aryans in Europe spoke the same ancient Aryan language spoken by their ancestors in the area of Iran, where the ancient Aryan nation originated. Over the years, due, the, due to the separation between Western and Eastern Aryans, which had no direct link for thousands of years, their ancient language slowly disappeared, though not before spawning daughter languages. In India, the ancient Aryan mother tongue evolved into Sanskrit, while in Europe it evolved into Greek and Latin. All of these in turn passed away and became dead languages existing only in scripture, Greek, Latin and Sanskrit. They evolved into daughter languages that both Europeans and Indians speak to this day. We are talking about a wide range of languages. Jones's theory, if we choose to accept it, does provide a rational explanation for the proximity between Sanskrit, Greek and Latin. However, this theory has no historical or archaeological proof or any objective evidence that can be cross-referenced and confirmed through other cultures. Therefore, to this day, we still call it the Aryan myth. Jones wasn't a racist. On the contrary, he was the most liberal and enlightened person. But his linguistic theory was applied to distinguish between Aryan, Semitic and other language families. To this day, modern philology uses the same terminology to determine various language branches. Jones's theory provided the academic foundation for the birth of modern philology to a great extent. Later in the 19th century, this innocent linguistic theory underwent dramatic changes and was stripped by race theoreticians across Europe, especially in Germany or the German-speaking states of that century. Instead of elaborating on this issue, since this lecture isn't long enough for an in-depth discussion of German philology in the 19th century, I'll only note that the profession of philology in general, and Sanskrit philology in particular, became one of the most dominant and innovative enterprises in European and particularly German academia during the 19th century. Across Europe, especially in the German states, we see the establishment of many chairs for Sanskrit, a subject that becomes more and more popular. It seems this profession is a field of research that can provide to all of mankind the best explanation of human history compared to any other research discipline. That's how modern philology is perceived in the 19th century. In various stages of the 19th century, we see researchers, some of them linguists and some from other academic fields, taking Jones's Aryan myth, which originally only describes a typological division between language families, and expand the notion into a real racist definition. 
the speakers of the Aryan languages, or to be accurate, the Indo-Europeans, as they start being called in the 19th century, suddenly belong to the family of Indo-European nations, while the speakers of the Semitic languages suddenly belong to the family of Semitic peoples, without anyone asking them. In other words, we see a strange extrapolation from linguistics to genetics, or a division into different ethnic groups. Between you and me, how exactly does the fact that Hebrew is my mother tongue make me belong to a Semitic people or race? There's obviously no connection. But now I hope you realize how this division is created in the 19th century, and how suddenly, in the second half of the century, when people talk about the Aryan and Semitic races, this total nonsense is established. I hope you understand the grounds on which people base their division of different human groups into these races. In the second half of the 19th century, there is an increasing number of race theoreticians formulating absurd hypotheses and racial theories that rewrite human history. One of the early and most prominent ones is, of course, Gobineau, a French noble who spent most of his life in Switzerland. He writes books describing the historic battle between the Aryan and Semitic races. He is followed by another famous theoretician called Chamberlain, an Englishman who becomes a German citizen and marries the daughter of famous composer Richard Wagner, as well as several others who totally distort the originally linguistic theories created in the non-racist, albeit imaginative mind of a British judge named William Jones in India in the late 18th century. What does all this have to do with the gypsy issue? Well, since philology is a field of research and very popular discipline in European academia, in the late 19th century, especially in Germany, towards the end of the century we see German linguistics wandering. Wait a minute, maybe we should study the language of these gypsies living among us, the Sinti. They speak a language we never learned, and it's time to combine our knowledge of the gypsy language with the knowledge acquired in the last century of countless languages, not just Sanskrit, but also ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, deciphered in 1821 by French philologist Jean-Francois Champollion, as well as cuneiform, discovered in Mesopotamia in the second half of the 19th century and many other languages that joined that ever-growing European database and language catalogue in the field of research. German philologists who studied the gypsy language discovered to their astonishment that Romani, the strictly oral gypsy language, is originally an Indian language. This immediately upgrades the status of the gypsies in the eyes of German racists, making them a part of the Aryan race, or the family of Indo-European nations along with Europe, the Indians, the Persians in Iran, and some other peoples. But this definitely boosts the gypsies to a much higher status than their previous label as a group originating in Egypt, and thus Semitic. Suddenly, the attitude towards them changes in German academia, and later on this trickles down into other aspects of German society. In the next lecture we'll see how this information, this insight regarding the gypsies' origin and their belonging to the Aryan race is expressed by some of the top Nazi leaders in the 1930s and 1940s. That's it for today. Thank you and see you later.